Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and tonight we are going to be talking about pollination. This is a really important topic for a lot of people, of course, if... uh, you eat. This is important. Uh, If you grow your own food, this is important. And basically, we need pollinators and we need to do our part in helping out the pollinators. And I'm talking more than just honeybees. And with me is the founder and overall pollinator expert. Um, She's the founder of Pollination Posse, which I absolutely love that name, is Tora Rocha. Pollinator Posse. Yeah, Pollinator Posse. There you go. Yeah. All right. She corrected me already. <laughs> uh, Tora Rocha. No, that's f- that's fine. I get things wrong all the time. So um, thanks for joining me, Tora. I've been trying to get you on the podcast for quite a while. And it's one of those where I'm like, hey, I'm going to hunt her down, get a hunt her down. <laughs> and then I get sidetracked and everyone's like, have you had her on your podcast? I'm like, no, do you have her contact information? No, I'll get it for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's Finally, funny. I'm like, I am getting her on my podcast. Um, you well, know, thank you for inviting uh, me. Yeah, this is great. We talked um a few weeks ago and it's one of those conversations where we we're like, oh, we could talk forever about plants and 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 you know, pollination <laughs> and and everything. Um and and I heard a little bit about your story how you you got into the pollinator world. But let's start. I always like to hear people's backstory because I think it sets up for for why you're so passionate about what you do. Um and I just I'm just nosy about people's lives in general. So I like to hear how they started (laughs) out. Um, It always makes me, you know, know how people tick and know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, So you could start far back as you want. Um, You could start, you know, from yesterday. But I really want to know how um, you got to where you're at today. Okay. Well, um, I actually grew up in California. I was born down in... um, in LA, the LA County area, and moved up here when I was five. We were pretty poor um, when I when I was growing up, and my parents used to take me to Lake Merritt um, because it was open and free to the public. And um, the gardens at Lake Merritt were like a secret garden to me in Children's Fairyland and the Rotary Nature Center. And I just grew up loving um, these magical little spots and. There's a little botanical garden, seven and a half acre botanical garden that was started in the 50s by garden clubs. And it was just mostly, you know, camellia gardens and fuchsia gardens. And I just thought it was super special. And I grew up wanting to make sure I got somewhere that I, like I was going to be able to work keeping things beautiful or doing something. And I really got into animals. And I, my first job with the city of Oakland um, actually was elephant training. Oh, I was an elephant trainer at the zoo. Ooh. And um, then I met some Jap- seventh generation Japanese gardeners. And I just fell in love with horticulture and decided to be on the other end of that manure pile. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and I got offered a, a job as a part time gardener, part time animal keeper with the city at Children's Fairyland. And that's when I really got the bug for horticulture, meeting, working with these master gardeners and these seven generation Japanese gardeners um, and realized how important plants are, you know, um, and that's what I like to talk about in, you know, um, everybody talks about it's pollination is important to, because the, the one third of every bite you take is from a pollinator, but it really is bigger than that. It's 80% of all plants in the entire planet need pollinators to reproduce. It's that important. Mm -hmm. I mean, plants are the the second most important thing on the planet besides water for life. And it, but why isn't the stewards of plants a more prestigious career? I have no idea. 
you know, and I don't think that we look at it in a proper way. And so I worked for the city of Oakland for 37 years and 26 of it or something. I was a gardener. Um, and then I became a park supervisor um, 2010 and I oversaw two public gardens, uh, gardens at Lake Merritt and also the Markham Rose Garden within a hundred different locations that I was in charge of. But I only had like nine full-time staff for these hundred locations. And most of it was with volunteers. Um, but it was going through Bay Friendly training, you know, now it's called Rescape, Rescape training where you learn, you know, the um, eight principles of, of landscaping that have to do with climate change. And I really got kind of woken up to what um, how landscapers have a big part. And I went and saw uh, an open forum landscape um, design class at Merritt College. And that was all about butterfly gardening with um, Andy Liu and Sal Levinson. And then I watched that movie, um, Queen of the Sun, a documentary about honeybees. And I just literally, Marlene had a, an epiphany and woke up in the middle of the night going, oh my God, it's not just farmers and pesticides, it's us. Mm -hmm. It's humans, it's how we look at landscapes. Mm -hmm. We're the ones screwing up everything because we're trying to make all of our landscapes aesthetically pleasing to humans. And so I decided that it was gonna be my thing that because I was aware of it and I had thousands of volunteers because I didn't have much staff, and I had staff that I had to get loud and realize that if you put your hands in the dirt, everything you do affects the local ecosystem. And that you need not start, you need to not call yourself a gardener. You need to call yourself a steward of our local ecosystem and start learning that what you do and how it's affecting the local ecosystem. And that's when the posse was born. I started <laughs> teaching the staff and I ran into um, a retired a school teacher, a science teacher that was looking for caterpillars um, to raise in classrooms because she didn't want to buy them online. She thought that was unethical, which it is. And um, especially migrating, especially monarchs, because mm -hmm. they migrate, you know, it's really bad. And that's really why I'm glad that they got listed endangered because the butterfly farms will have to be, that it won't be allowed anymore, I'm sure. Because ah, okay. um, that's really important. Um, mass rearing is what causes disease, which is really bad. And when the populations are so low, we just have to stop that, you know, stop it in its tracks. So I think that's a good thing. Um, and, you know, in the deforestation of the forests where they overwinter and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but I realized it's everything we do. And then I realized that as professionals, we have the chance to change the perception that the public thinks of when it looks at landscapes. Like I would have people email me saying, why didn't you weed this area along the lake shore? And, you know, um, I'd go out there and I'd see it was plantain and thistle. Mm -hmm. And plantain is one of the plants that I talk about a lot, how, you know, it's considered a weed and people weed it out of their lawns. But I go out there, it's actually the host plant for the buckeye butterfly. Oh. And it's also, okay. but in Chinese medicine, they make it a tea out of it to treat asthma. And then in um, herbalists make poultices out of it to treat bee stings. Hmm. So like, why is that a weed? That's an important plant for the, for us, for everyone. So I want people to weed their lawns out of their plantain. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. But anyway, I would put a sign out, like people would email me, why didn't you weed this? I get like 50 emails. Then I started putting signs out. And it said, pardon our, um, pardon our weeds, it's pollinator habitat. The same 50 people would email me and say, thank you for what you're doing. Oh. So it showed me that as landscapers, we just need to educate the public. We can change the perception of what they expect in their landscapes. And that's when I decided to start the posse. It's almost funny. It's almost like when they saw the weeds, their first instinct possibly was to think, wow, people are being lazy and they're not doing their job. That's what I got right. from that. Or, or, you know, like the people who do want the manicured lawns are like, oh, you can't have this. Everything has to be manicured. But as soon as you make it right. like, no, this has a purpose. We're not ignoring this. We're doing this on purpose. And this is why it's nice that they're receptive to it. 
Right. Well, you know, it's going to, you're going to have some people that want that neat and night, mm-hmm. um, tidy look, but if you look at nature, there's nothing neat and tighter about nature, no. really. You know, it's like, and and I tell people nature worked all by itself mm-hmm. before we got involved. Yeah. I hate to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so um, I do stick to that rule of thumb, like Doug told me about um, 75% of your um, habitat should be native plants to your region, but not all. There's there's some non-natives that are actually beneficial. Um and that I use um, like Tithonia, um, Mexican sunflower, yes. I think is okay. one of my absolute go-to plants. Like mm. it is a pollinator. Everything loves it. Hummingbirds, monarchs. I didn't get monarchs in the gardens in Oakland until I put milkweed and Tithonia together. And Verbena, those are those. Okay. Yeah, it was like, and then we started because they're, you know, they come back to coastal California in the fall because they're looking for their overwintering sites. So it's the fall blooming um, plants in the Bay Area that you want. Like here, they're coming through a little earlier, more like September. Okay. So you want, if you're looking to help monarchs um, in general, that's, you know, you want that late blooming, um, um, summer, fall blooming um, plants to get the monarchs to come as they're coming back. And then early spring is another one when they're, they're starting the migration. Okay. So Sacramento area that, you know, this area, it's like the early, mer- early March, early February blooming. And um, because the parents are looking for nectar, you know, mm-hmm. and not just milkweed to lay their eggs on, they need the nectar source. And the Tithonia is one of, it's a great nectar source and you'll see everything, bumblebees, hummingbirds. It's just one of those go-to plants that, um, people I see start collecting like I have master gardeners up here that now propagate Tithonia a lot because I talk about it so much um and I in verbena, I, in verbena the native <laughs> native verbena especially right the little yes Cena. yes mm-hmm. okay that, yeah that one and um lactostachys I think it is the other native verbena the the verb you can't lose with verbenas but the elisfolia the um the delamina mm-hmm. the hybrid that blooms 365 days of the year, Crazy. even here in Auburn. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. die out. And it'll, mm-hmm. even the dead of December, it had a few flowers on it. Um, and that's, you know, the thing about pollinators is <clears throat> there's so many um, bees and native bees that people don't talk about. And that, that is really one of the main reasons I started the posse was because I realized as a park supervisor, that I was removing the habitat um, in our landscapes for the native bees. Once I didn't even knew they existed. I mean, a bumblebee I knew about, but the rest of them, and there's 1600 different species of native bees in the state. That's and incredible. only We only talk about, yeah, we only talk about honeybees, which are not native. And, and yeah, and, and I, and I do, you know, I, w- I want to sort of focus on that mainly is we've been bombarded with, we're killing the honeybees. We need a, protect honeybees. Honeybees is what gives us food. For sure, a lot of our crops are, you know, dependent on the honeybees. But in your own garden, if you just go and look at a flower, like you said, there's 1,600 native native California bees. That's mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. But also, it's not our major crops. There's so much research now if you use native bees, like orchard bee, mason bees, mm-hmm. leaf cutter bees, it's proven now that that you will get 25% higher yield than you would from honeybees. Wow. It's because honeybees, honeybees, they pack the pollen in the neck, like they pack the pollen on their saddlebags, I call them. Uh-huh. And they it it's it makes it it's all waxy. So when they go to the next flower, that pollen isn't readily available to the next flower. So it's like the but the native bees, they have like leaf cutter bees have scopa. It's like hairs on their belly, uh-huh. and they sort of they sort of belly flop from flower to flower. So they're doing a way higher um, pollination rate than honeybees. It's just there's so many more honeybees in a hive. Mm. Most there's like, there's social bees and non solitary bees is how they classify them, and the only social bee that's native bees the bumblebee. The rest are solitary females doing all the work by herself. There's no queen. 
There's no um, workers. It's the single female that's doing all the reproducing of the species. Like, well, of course she mates, but I meant like she's the one who goes out and collects the nectar and the pollen and she finds like 30% of them are wood cavity nesters. Okay. And the other 70 are ground nesters. And because as landscapers, we were using weed cloth in the parks to keep the weeds down. Mm-hmm. Well, we were get we were removing the habitat for the ground nester bees. You can't use weed cloth. It's bad. And um and then also we were removing the dead wood in the trees to make the park safer for humans. I was removing the wood cavity nesters habitat because they use old woodpecker holes or beetle holes to lay their eggs. They don't make their own holes. They find um reeds, they use reeds like in an old um dead wood like in roses. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you'd see like a dead cane. And you'd see that there was something plugged a hole at the top of the dead cane. And that's how you can tell if they've used that is um, like leaf cutter bees will use leaf matter to plug the holes. And then mason bees will use clay or mud. And then the woolly carter bees will use the white pubescent hairs like on stackies, like woolly's lamb's ears. That's one of their favorite um, plants to Ooh. have in their territory because they use the pubescent hairs on the leaves to clog their to make their nesting materials and to clog the hole so there's all there's different bees use different material and so it's kind of fun like resin bees make this kind of resin looking stuff that'll plug the hole so um it's actually i would say that over manicuring and over pruning a yard Mm -hmm. can be just as detrimental as as pesticides <laughs> for, you know, pesticides are the number one thing. Don't do, yes. yeah, you know, mm-hmm. but especially the pre- preventative, like that monthly Clark's, I don't, I shouldn't say a name. So like <laughs> the monthly, the monthly spring of your house, oh, because you're afraid to get insects is like I, probably the biggest contributor to the, the, you know, the apocalypse. That's I, going on. I don't like, understand how people could I mean, doesn't that scare them? Like if I don't have bugs in my house, I start going, uh oh, uh oh, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> you I, and I both. I'm, I'm like, like <laughs> am I next to to die? Cause what's going on? But I can't believe and you know, I, there's even people out there who were like, Oh, I only garden organically, and yet they spray their house. They're not putting two to two together. Um Exactly. It's, like Xerxes. I don't know if you saw Xerxes report on milkweeds that they did two years ago. Where have. they t- different milkweed all up the state of California, mm-hmm. some in, in their own employees' backyards, and then some in state parks and federal parks. They found 69 different kinds of pesticides in the milkweeds. Oh. And they found zero milkweed without any traces of pesticides. Even in their employees' own backyard, they found termiticides and stuff that was residual in the soil. Oh. So you know that that has to be contributing to the decline. It has to if be. These yes. in, if these insects can't get, so the number, like if you're a gardener, I would hope you would be if you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> There's two things to take away is how important what you do is for the planet and to think differently, but to realize you're a steward of the ecosystem. But is to, is to when you plant your native plants and you plant, your plants for the pollinators, that the source of where they come from is critical. Not to buy plants from box stores, not to buy from nurseries that are using the neonicotinoids, which is anything that's systemic, anything that stays in the plant Mm -hmm. is really bad because they now know it can stay in the soil for up to 10 years. Am I wrong? Do they have to label plants now if they've sprayed them with neonicotinoids? Or is it now just banned? (laughs) No, and part of the problem is it's they're, they're going to come up. They're about to ban them okay. in California, but you know that bear and everybody's making the new, the yeah. next the, best thing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, so that's why I say if we can train people to care and to teach them that just systemics in general are bad yes. yeah, because good point. we can't, yeah, because they're going to constantly change the chemical, mm-hmm. but it's, it's actually how it, it, is it's taken up by the plant and stay in the plant to kill chewing insects. Mm-hmm. Well, caterpillars are chewing insects. So no matter what, just like, you know, like even, and, and, you know, I, I defend the nurseries too, because 
the state forces them to spray their stock if they have an infestation. Mm -hmm. So if we can get the state to be the one that demands they spray the stock, but spray it with something that you can wash off as a consumer. Because personally, I'm mad if you're going to, like you at you advertise these are bee and butterfly friendly plants, but yet you have yeah. systemics that are going to kill it in it. It's like you just stole money from me. Yeah, really. Yeah, you know. And I want to. I want to be. I want to be my. I want to be able to consume and buy what I am looking for and have the choice. Let me make my own. Mm-hmm. You know, not you make that choice for me and. A lot of the times when you go to a retail nursery, they don't even know because it's the wholesale nurseries that are doing the, the, so we did, I worked with a woman in urban, she does urban BSF and she was trying to do trees for bees project Mm -hmm. throughout San Francisco, because look at how big the canopy of a tree is. That's a lot of nectar when it blooms, Yeah, you know, and that could be in an urban setting. That's could be the ticket to saving the pollinators. But we, they couldn't find one wholesale nursery in California that did not treat their trees with neonics. Oh, wow. Not one. Wow. And so there's like a big hunt now. And I know that Xerxes is listing, they have a good list of nurseries on their site. And so does I think Monarch Joint Venture too. But that's a national site. Okay. Um, but in California, um, in CNPS, California State, I mean, California Plant Society, they Mm -hmm. have a pretty good list of neonic free um, nurseries now. Um, And we're trying to work, we're working with the conservation districts. Um, They're going to send out surveys to all the nurseries because in a restoration, conservation restoration projects, they have to be able to source healthy plants. So they want to be able to contract grow with nurseries that are not using that for all this conservation going on. So it's super important and so I just like to trickle down that information to the homeowner too. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's, it's super important, if you really want to plant for pollinators that you get it from a good nursery, it's really like, you know, there's a lot of small nurseries. Um, I tell people also, you know, like we were talking about how the state forces the nursery to, to spray their stock. And it's mostly if they're crossing state lines and it's to keep the bad bugs from mm-hmm. crossing straight lines. So if you buy a local, small local nursery that doesn't ship across state lines, you're more likely to have um, a product that, uh, and a plant that doesn't have the index. Yeah. And I think it so, also gets back to educating homeowners and people. And, you know, I mean, you're constantly doing this, I'm sure. And I am too, that it's okay to have pests on your plant, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's why the nurseries do it because it's sort of like our fruit where you know, trained to not buy the blemished fruit. That's why, you know, it has to be perfect. It's it's okay to have aphids. They're not the worst thing in the world. It's okay to have some disfigured, discolored leaves, you know, disease. Yeah. You don't want to buy diseased plant, but if you, there's even a research. Yeah. There's, there's a research paper that just came out that the caterpillars of monarchs actually do better on plants that have other insects on it on it like aphids and stuff that they actually survive because when you don't have the aphids when the ladybug larva is around or the wasps they're going to eat the caterpillars not the aphids Mm. and so they actually have a better chance of surviving if they have other insects and stuff i just tell people like we were working on me and some other landscapers on solutionary blends because that's like one of the main complaints i get from people about milkweed is that it attracts the oleander aphid. Mm. But to me, that means that I'm happy because that yeah. means that plant wasn't sprayed. That's my canary in the, in the coal mine, you know? It's like, yeah, I mean, we have that's one. That's a pesticide-free plant. And we have, yeah, we have the, I think it's the linearis right now. It's it's covered, just the very tips of each, you know, a branch is covered uh-huh. in the oleander aphids. Plant could care less. Plant's fine. You know, I walk by, I'm no, like- plant is fine. And I'm like, isn't that interesting? I'm like, look at all of them. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm walking by. <laughs> You know, uh, it's, I think- <laughs> what I tell people now is to plant um, for hoverflies, oh. plant things with your milkweed. So like if you plant yarrow, uh-huh. cause hoverflies like white or yellow, they're attracted to white and yellow. Okay. Like a lot of people do, like I had, you know, alyssum, it's a non-native, mm-hmm. but alys- they love alyssum and 
candy tuft are what nurseries use. Mm -hmm. Now they're, they're purposely planting around their stock, like um, alyssum and candy tuft to attract the hoverflies, which will eat the aphids. Okay. And that's, so I call those solutionary blends of plants. Like if you know you're going to get aphids, then plant things that attract hoverflies because they're one of the best. I think they say that each larva eat like 500 aphids. Oh, oh, okay. That's a good amount. Yeah. yeah. And they're great pollinators. We never talk about hoverflies mm -hmm. and flies. The surfeit flies and hoverflies are great pollinators too. So that's to us, that's our new favorite hero is the hoverfly. All right. So, um, I, I do want to go, I mean, the, uh, um, I sort of want to summarize what you said about the bees, just so people could, um, and then I then want to sort of touch briefly on what milkweeds versus what not milkweeds for the monarchs and just quickly their life cycle. But I want to sort of reiterate what you said about the bees. native bees. So a little bit of bare ground, no weed block. If you see holes, don't panic, right? I imagine it looks like soda yep. or, you know, they're digging holes. That's good. Leave some wood debris because that's going to be your right. mason, mason type bees. Um, Leaf cutter bees, mason bees, osmias. There's a lot of bees. There's like 30% okay. of the native bees use wood cavities. So leaving, I mean, and don't buy the Costco bee house. Okay. It's not deep enough. It's most of them are made out of cedar and cedar is it got a natural insecticide. It's kind of, it's kind of a note. It's an oxymoron, it's like, <laughs> but you can, you can, what I tell people, if you have a dead tree, cut it chest high and drill holes on the Southeast side. Southeast and then you side, have okay. a bee. Yeah. Then you have a bee hotel. <laughs> All right. How deep it's should just, the holes be? At okay. least six inches. Okay. All right. And the reason is the female bees, um, each bee um, will, she usually will complete, like, depending on the species, but like five or six holes, she'll fill up herself. And each, in each hole, she makes separate chambers. And it like, when you harvest the bee, the little cocoons, uh -huh. they look like a little cocoon. And then the baby bee will live out its, most of its life in there and come out the next spring or summer, whichever species it is but she lays about um 10 anywhere from six to ten different chambers in there and they lay the female eggs in the back of the hole and the male's eggs will be at the front of the hole in case a predator gets in because you need more females to, i know it's interesting and it's <laughs> they can it's crazy they keep when they mate the sperm packet stays separate than her eggs okay. in her body. Uh -huh. And so the female, the, when she puts an egg, if, if the sperm packet and an egg are placed together, then that's a female bee. And if they don't, she doesn't use the sperm packet, it'll become a male. That's, I'm just learning this myself <laughs> blows my mind. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> they can even, that they can control mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. um, there's a great little movie out right now. I highly recommend everyone to watch. It's adorable. It's silly and cute, but it's amazing. I mean, blow your mind cinematography that um, is a, around a grant that's going around all the libraries. It's from a cinematographer from David Attenborough's cruise. Mm -hmm. And it's called My Garden of a Thousand Bees. And it's on oh. PBS. Okay. My garden of and a it's thousand this, bees. Right. He's a cinematographer that worked with David Attenborough during COVID was locked down and let his backyard in Britain go wild. And he put little logs with holes. And then he filmed the, the 16 different species of native bees in his backyard. And it's phenomenal. I learned, I learned so much during that movie. And to have the visuals that are going along with what I'm talking about, the nesting, because uh -huh. they even have these observation trays where you, it has plexiglass on one side so you can actually see the larva inside i'm definitely and, gonna have um, to watch that that sounds fascinating yeah yeah i'm gonna and you can buy the observation trays for mason bees and leaf cutter bees from crownbees.com mm -hmm. um and i've bought a few because we want to be able to film the oh, transformation yeah. so it's it's very it's really cool i mean and it's fascinating. And um, so there's different ways you can help the native bees, but not, I, I tell people keep 
the neat and tidy yard that you want closer to your house, but let the back of your yard go a little wild. Yeah. And then you'll see you plant the right co- plant combinations. Mm-hmm. You don't over prune because most like a lot of the bees and butterflies, they use the plant material to hibernate, you know, like hair streak butterflies when they, the caterpillar will free fall to the ground when it's ready to pupate, wrap itself up in a dead leaf and wait out till spring. So if you're raking all your leaves and putting in your compost, you could be wiping out generations oh. of butterflies and, and in other insects. And like the same with the, the bees are using the reeds, some different kind of reedy grasses and, and the dead wood and trees. And so just that over pruning and pruning everything to the ground all the time is not the answer for a habitat garden. Yeah. Cause there's more than you have just to pay attention feeding them. There's more than just, Oh, here's some flowers for them. And, and on that point, you were mentioning that the native bees, they're pollen collectors and nectar seekers. So right. they go to a lot that of the whole life cycle. Yes. Correct. There's a, so many crossover plants. Like, you know, people are like, Oh, you know, what if is- I plant this for the butterflies, what'll come in? And it's like, you know, that's why there's the top, like if you go to, the, you know, cowscape, um, has done a fabulous job of listing all the native plants and on the picture of the plant to the left of it, it'll be a number of lepidoptera that use that plant. So I say, go to your region, put in your zip code and then go to the biggest bang for your buck. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like, and you know what that's going to be. We all know it's the oak tree. The oak tree is more lepidoptera use oak trees than any other plant. That's why Doug Ptolemy you say, if you only can plant one plant for your your local wildlife, plant an oak tree. Interesting. Um, and it's huh. and it's seventy five percent of all um, food that songbirds feed their fledglings. Seventy five percent are caterpillars. Seventy. Wow. You see, it takes three three thousand caterpillars to feed a brood of bluebirds. Wow. So that oak that oak worm uh-huh. that you got everybody complains about. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's feeding all the songbirds. We don't care. It's not going to, it's not going to kill your oak tree. It, it never defoliates it until it's dead ever. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's pruning it for you. Yeah. It's like, and, and that's the thing. don't with, spray them. That's the thing with almost every larvae, ca- or, or like caterpillar, mm-hmm. butterfly larvae is when people send it to me, I'm like, chances are the damage is already passed. It's such a transitory stage that by the time you see the damage, it's gone. And almost all trees, you know, I have red buds, red bud questions that are being defoliated. Like you said, the mm-hmm. oak uh, moth. And it's like these trees could handle it. They've almost, almost sort of evolved with it to a certain extent, but it takes a lot of pressure. Right. Um, and, yeah. And- there are some, you know, like the, the pine pitch canker beetle that, that was a different story, oh, yeah. you know, but some of the beetles. The, yeah. The, but yeah, but the majority it's like, it's a key, these are keystone species. Mm -hmm. I mean, once the caterpillars are gone, the songbirds are gone, then what's next? You know, it's like, we, we can't be so afraid of losing our little plants at home that we are wiping a bigger picture. Like, and like I said, 80% of all plants on the planet have to have pollinators, you know, and that's why we started with pollinators. It's because they're the bottom of the food chain. It's really about healthy ecosystems, the posses. That's what we're trying to get. You know, it's the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, explain, because, you know, and I purposely didn't want this to be all monarch focused. They're incredibly important. Like you said, they've just been um, labeled um, highly endangered, right? Is that the endangered? Endangered. Yes. At the international level, not, Mm -hmm. and it's only the, and it's the migrating um, monarchs, not the, because they're, in five places in the world, there's year round monarchs like Hawaii, Australia, South Africa, where they're not migratory. They're not migrating. So okay. it's the migrating, the ones in North America that migrate um, to Mexico from Canada. And then the ones, the Western monarchs are even more endangered because of their population. It rebounded this year, but the year before, they only counted 2,000 along the whole entire coast of California when there used to be millions. You know, wow. and so that that's what got everyone's attention because people panicked. Mm-hmm. But then they were there was two hundred fifty thousand this year, so it. But 
because insects can lay so many eggs, they do can be, their population can be bouncy like that. Okay. Um, and no, nobody knows why. Yeah. They can't figure it out if it's fire. You know, I, I think fire plays a big role on their migration to the coast. I would, I would think that there's something to do with, I mean, the signals, I mean, smoke is an irritant in the air. So how they communicate. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right, it's, it's got it. And I don't know any wildlife that runs into smoke. I think almost all wildlife, you know, mm-hmm. being an animal keeper in my past, I kind of, I think sometimes I like them <laughs> and it's, it's an instinct to run away from smoke. Yeah. So I would think that, I mean, they said they've tested it and it doesn't really affect them, but I can't uh, see how it can not. Yeah. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe it. Um, but that's just me. I'm not an entomologist. I'm a landscaper. So, <laughs> but, so I, I do want to talk about the monarchs just briefly. I like your, uh, you know, I, I the migratory versus not. Um, and we talked about how um, in the Tithonia, and I was thinking asters, native asters for the fall. Yes. Uh, is a great yes, one. Yes, yes, So, But you have to have your Absolute. butterfly. And when people think butterfly flowers, for the most part, I always say butterflies need a landing pad. That's why a lot of them go to like the daisy family, the asteraceae, because you have a whole bunch mm-hmm. of the little flowers in. Also anything with umbels. Yeah, like the you know, like the family. yarrow mm-hmm. and the carrot family. Well, the anise swallowtail, that's their host plant is the carrot family. Got it. So, okay. You know, and that's like planting for the whole life cycle. Like, just like you said, not just only where they're going to lay their eggs, mm-hmm. but also the nectar to attract the adults. And I mean, in this, like here, like I would, this like central California is like the hotbed for pollinators, mm. you know, and it's really important to get um, native milkweed into that because they have to go through the central California to get in the migratory path from the coast when they leave the coast. And because central California is probably the highest use of pesticides, it's really important that we get people in their suburban homes or their urban homes or their rural homes to be mm-hmm. planting milkweed so that um because you know in the people get confused like they they say you know it's the roundup in the midwest that's killing the bees and the the my monarchs and stuff and it's not necessarily the roundup that's killing them it's because before farmers would spot spray between the rows and so there would be hedgerows that had milkweed and flowers and around the edges because it was too expensive for them to spray but when they created gmo crops that are resistant to roundup now they crop dust with out of a plane with roundup and it kills everything else around it except for that crop so there's no wild edges along our agriculture zones there's just no habitat for them there's no habitat. Yeah. There's no hedgerows. And that's why Xerxes, Xerxes um, all of the monarch joint venture, all of the big, um, you know, Lepidoptera institutions or um, uh, what am I saying? The nonprofits and people trying to conserve them. They focus on farmers and ranchers. You know, ranchers didn't want to plant milkweed because they say it kills their cattle. They don't kill their cattle. <laughs> it's like, I I see cattle go and I had one sheep farmer say that he lost one sheep to milkweed, the toxicity. And I said, you don't want that sheep in your your <laughs> gene pool anyway. It's like if it's stupid enough to eat it and deer don't eat it. Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you don't you don't want that sheep in your gene pool. It's, yeah. like it's, it's Darwinism you know? at its finest, exactly. right? There. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But for years and years, people didn't want to plant milkweed because they thought it was dangerous to cattle or whatever. It's like, you no, know, these myths get started. Yeah. Well, I, I do my talks to a lot of garden clubs and they're like, don't plant milkweed. It's invasive. It's like, no, you're, we're invasive. Yeah. <laughs> Humans are invasive. So milkweed is necessary. So it's funny because the day after I posted, um, one of the pictures of my milkweed, um, we talked 
And you were very kind not to call me out on it because I call people out all the time <laughs> on not planting native milkweeds. And I know the, the the family jewels. I think they changed it. It's not even Asclepius anymore. It's Physocarpa, no. right? I think. I, no, no, it, it was Asclepius Physocarpa, but now it's gone. Gumfeet, confetti. There, there uh, it is. Yeah. G. It starts with a G. Gum something. Yeah. But. Yeah. And it's not native, but it makes me giggle so much. But, but it's right. I know. So, we everybody loves it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true because I realize in my previous garden it would die down and it would often not come back because I had a really exposed garden. And then I just planted it last year and I realized I'm like it didn't die down. It was like on the east or south side of my house. I'm like it didn't die down. I'm like wait a minute. Mm-mm. You're not supposed to plant the non-native tropicals because they don't die down necessarily in the winter like the native ones do. And why is that why is that important for you to plant natives versus these non-native ones? Um well, with the physocarpa, let's talk about that one, the okay. family jewels. The, some people call it the swan plant. It's got so many names. Um, I mean, I've even heard it called hairy balls. Yeah. Like, it's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, whatever. I, I take it the middle route, the family jewels. I can't. The family <laughs> jewels, yeah. And, but I have had, because working in Oakland, I had a temperate climate. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that cold winter and it would not die back. Also gets eight feet, but it is a horrible reseeder. And my biggest fear is that it'll get loose in the open space. Got it. Okay. If you if you're in a temperate climate, and then we're going to have another scotch broom on our hands. Got it. Because it's a really really bad reseeder. Mm-hmm. Um, it's even more than cursavica. Um, so I tell people, please don't buy that. I used to love that planet. It was yes. one of my favorites. The monarchs really like it. And even in my um, fundraiser where we light up the garden at night as a fundraiser down there, uh-huh. we would actually put LED bulbs in the seed pods. Oh. And we put a little tape it to a battery and we put, we pierce it and we put the the lights inside the bulb, oh the my balls, and it would sway in the wind. It was so pretty. I loved it. Okay. So, I um, I want to do that, but now I don't want to do it because I don't want people to find <laughs> that. But <laughs> Because it's it's gonna come out in fall. I'm 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 done with the family jewels. But if they don't die down, the monarchs keep feeding on it and they don't migrate. Is that the no no well, that's well, okay? Then that's kind of the theory. No, what the problem is the biggest problem with non um, with with milkweed that doesn't go dormant is that it becomes a host for the OE parasite. There's a protozoa that can lead monarchs to be so weak they can't migrate um and it's a protozoa that gets left behind on the plant by an infected monarch that flies through and then at the protos the spores of this protozoa are on the leaves of the plants and then when they lay their eggs the caterpillars chew the spores then they're infected and a lot of times you'll see people that they'll have a chrysalis and then it doesn't come out all the way or the the, the butterfly comes out and its wings are all crumpled and mm-hmm. broken and weird. That's the protozoa. That means the talk to- that has a toxic load of that protozoa. It depends. A lot of them can fly and that's why they're infecting other milkweeds. And so if your plant doesn't lose its leaves, then it that crop of protozoa just keeps getting built higher and higher the spores are more and more on that plant, but our native milkweeds go dormant. And so all the spores are gone for that year. It doesn't stay in the dirt. All right. And so that's why that's Mm -hmm. the main reason why there was always this comparison. My fear of it getting caught in the open, open in the open space, you know, get Uh reseeding. That's my own personal fear by seeing how, I mean, I literally saw in the fall um, when you're in November, literally under two plants it was a lawn of seedlings literally by 20 feet by 10 feet spot or thousands of seedlings and the monarchs had come through and laid eggs there were like 500 caterpillars this one spot and because it looked like a lawn people were stepping oh Oh. And I was like, ah ah, no this is not good and then and then the temperatures dropped because dramatically and none of those caterpillars made it yeah because they're all temperature mm-hmm. related we don't want them breeding in november it's not okay because um we even had one chrysalis you know monarchs they go they don't go to cocoon everyone calls it a cocoon it's a chrysalis Mo- moths have cocoons 
because it means wrapped in silk mm. and butterflies have chrysalis and most butterfly chrysalis look like dead leaves. And that's why I was talking about pruning over pruning your yard. You wouldn't even recognize a chrysalis if you saw it on a branch. Um, and so they waited out the winter in this chrysalis. I mean, Aww. and wait until the next spring. And if you're cutting all your plants to the ground, you probably are wiping out generations of Aww. Plepidoptera. So it's like, the plants don't need to be over pruned. Mm -hmm. They really don't. Mm -hmm. It's our, it's our, we just love to garden. So we're out there gardening. <laughs> like, and I, it's like deadhead, don't deadhead your plants. Leave the seeds for the birds. Like it cracks me up when you see people deadheading their plants mm -hmm. and then they run out and buy seed for their for bird feeder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is. It's or... the same as like raking, raking your leaves and you put it in your compost and roll mm -hmm. it to the street. Then you run out and buy compost. I'm like, it, just rake your leaves under your shrubs yeah. and sprinkle a little compost. It's well, like, yeah. And I, what I do now is when I rip out most of my vegetables or, you know, for the season, I just take my pruners and I cut them up into little pieces and lay them right on top of the soil. I'm like, eh, you know, well, it's, it's, vegetables you know. are a little different. Yeah. Vegetables are a little different because that's a crop. Yeah. yeah. To... When we're talking hot habitats yeah. and crops are not the same, you know, that's why I mean, leave your crops like your vegetable gardens but on your edges of your vegetable gardens is where you create your habitat see, because of, that's going to pollinate your vegetables. But see, in my vegetable gardens, different. I don't have rows. I have just everything mixed in between. Um, that's how I garden too. Yeah. So like, I, I, I'm like, I think I have one row of vegetables. The rest is like pepper plant here, you know, like uh, you know, corn plant. I know corn plants are supposed to be, but I like to grow some ornamental corns for their foliage. And it's like mm. there. And then here's my basil. And, you know, my big thing is I let most of my herbs just go to flower right away because they're such good flowers for pollinators oh. that I'm like, oh my God, the basil, it's that insane. there's a, oh yeah, that purple basil, uh -huh. I forgot. What is it? Purple Af magic or Af there's African, African blue, ba African blue Af basil. That one, that one is, is insane for pollinators. It is insane it, for it me. It is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know what it, it's crazy. It's crazy. And, um, and yeah. oregano, oregano is another one. Mm -hmm. Oregano, if mm -hmm. you see honeybees on oregano, they have, it's pink pollen. So they have pink pollen sacks. Oh, it's nice. so cute. Oregano is one of those. Yeah, there's so many herbs. Yeah, that are, I, I just let them all, I let I my carrots go to flower just because I don't like carrots and my carrots go to flower, beautiful flowers. So, but well, yeah. And the host plants, yeah. The anna swallowtails will lay yeah. eggs on those. So actually speaking of that, so we got the monarch. So native and, you know, my favorite, there's a lot of native milkweeds. Uh, Speciosa, the showy milkweed to me is just absolutely a beautiful flower. Um, and Davis, the Davis hybrid. Mm -hmm, oh my God. Mm -hmm. That is so gorgeous. So what are some other native butterflies? Because we want to give them some shout outs right. too. <laughs> like Gar Shapiro says, yeah, it's like he says that he talks to this entomologist in Mexico, and he's like, "You dang gringos, always talking about the monarchs. There's so many more butterflies that need to help." I know <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's and it's like yeah. so true. The anis anis swallowtails. I think we need to plant more native. We need to put more of the native plants that they're attracted to, like yampa. Yep. And, okay. you know, and Pridia and all that, because they're, they're going to fennel, but mm -hmm. right when the fennel, where the caterpillars are about, to, they're knocking it down with weed eaters because nobody oh. likes fennel. Yeah. So I taught my staff, if you have fennel in your yard and you want to, it's, it's not invasive by the rhizomes. It's just, it recedes. It recedes. So just don't let it go to seed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the seeds, I don't know if you've ever grazed on your fennel plant, but they're like candy, the mm -hmm. seeds. It's it's like, just cut them off and just leave it. Or if you're going to cut it, like if you have to cut the fennel down, then just leave it in a five gallon bucket of water and lean it against your fence. And then the caterpillar will be able to crawl off and go to chrysalis on its own before it completely. And then when it's completely brown and dry, then throw it in the compost. Okay. But, but most, most butterflies don't go to chrysalis on their host plant that's the part that confuses people like you don't you don't normally see a chrysalis from a monarch on milkweed they usually climb off and climb up on something sturdy because they're going to be super vulnerable 
especially if they're going to stay year. like monarchs come out in 14 days, 10 to 14 days. They don't stay a season, you know, in a, in a chrysalis, mm-hmm. the way other butterflies do. So the other butterflies, they go to a plant that has bigger leaves, like a tree or a larger shrub. Um, I, one time we, I had my staff, there was a big pineapple sage next to some milkweed and some fennel. And they wanted to cut it down because it gets, you know, leggy and big. And I'm like, you better look at every single branch before you throw it in the compost. And sure enough, we found 18 chrysalis oh. on that one plant. Whoa. And normally that would just get hacked to the ground and thrown uh-huh. away. And you, you know? think that was so, because it was right by the milkweed. So you had a feeling that it went right. Or Right. Well, I, I looked around and I said, if I was a caterpillar and I wanted to go somewhere safe yeah. to hang out, you know, and a lot of times you'll find them on the under the upper railing of like a fence, you know, that top railing mm-hmm. on the underside, because they try to get out of the wind and the weather. Mm-hmm. And so leaves with trees with big leaves on them, you know, and they could be anywhere depending on the host plant. Every butterfly has a different plant family, mm-hmm. you know, like the pale swallowtails. We hardly see those anymore. That's coffee berry is their host plant. Oh. Um, you know, the tiger swallowtails, you hardly ever see those caterpillars because it's the sycamores and the willows are their host plants. So they're at the top of trees. That's why I've never seen a tiger swallowtail caterpillar because they're usually way up there in the trees. Got it. And the pipe vine so swallowtail, the native pipe I vine. love that's Yeah. And nobody plants pipe vine because they don't think it's very pretty. Oh, it's amazing. And now with, with the fire clearing that's going on I did I saw half as many oh. swallowtails this year it's oh. so sad so please people plant pipe vine in your yard um yeah. it's so slow growing too so we can't wait we need to start planting more now okay um th- they were actually extinct in Oakland flatlands and we brought the posse had a project and um started planting it and getting people to plant it and now they're back in the flatlands of Oakland. Oh good. It only took about it took about seven years. And and that's mainly but, for planting the pipe vine because that's that was correct. their 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 I know they they feed on it or yeah. they yeah, they feed on it. Um, no, they don't they don't yeah, they lay their eggs and on they it. Lay their eggs. The okay. It's the only plant that their caterpillars can eat. Wow. So and and they're interesting because they do everything in clusters. Like monarchs, you know, when they lay an egg, they lay their eggs far apart because uh-huh. of predators. But the pipe vine, they'll lay like 20 to 30 eggs in a cluster on, the, on a plant. And the caterpillars hatch and they eat the same leaf. They they do everything together. It's very sweet. Oh, it's it's very interesting. Hmm. It is. Even where they go to chrysalis, um, they tend to go to chrysalis. Like our house, when we bought it, had about 30 chrysalis on the side of the house. And we we nicknamed it the Chrysalis Castle. Oh, <laughs> like, I like and that. um it was all and Art Shapiro, when I got to um interview him and talk with him, he said that they tend to always go where they saw other chrysalis. And because it, it's a successful thing. They do do everything in um kind of in a in a in a gang. <laughs> They're like the gang men. And it's sweet. Um, we yeah. found railroad trusses that had hundreds of chrysalis on them. Um, and they'll go up to 800 feet to find a secure place Ooh. that a caterpillar. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty high. And that is high. Yeah. So I think what's really important when you're planting po- like butterfly host plants mm-hmm. is remember, like what I said, the plant for the whole life cycle. Yeah. So you never want, like, say you have a, like a, patch in the middle of your yard but it's surrounded by sidewalk or decking that I mean or like you know concrete you don't really want that because if that chrysalis that caterpillar has to crawl away to go find somewhere to go to chrysalis it might get stomped on like Mm -hmm. and if it's near a pathway you want them sort of back the edges of your yard where they can use a fence or a tree you know they have some other things to go and be and be secure because most of the time they're going to get eaten anyway. That's part of the food chain they are. It's like, and they say they can lay up to 400 eggs, like the larger caterpillar, larger species, uh-huh. but maybe one, maybe one will make it in nature. Oh gosh. So That's their depressing. odds are, <laughs> well, and then when we throw pesticides on top of that, I, I mean, they, yeah. they really are such an important 
piece of the food chain mm-hmm. is the is the butterfly the the larva it, and it's for a lot of different species not just i mean the bees they have a lot of predators too wasps and there's other cuckoo bees that will lay eggs in the native bee nests and the larva will eat the the native bee larva <laughs> it's like they yeah. they have a hard time too yeah but, so when we when we make the little we call them airbnbs our little condos for the bee, the native bees and we have kids, we do outreach and we have kids like color, um, be these little birdhouses and then put paper straws in them. And we call them the Airbnb for the single moms of the bee world. <laughs> and the, the kids love that. They're like, yeah. yay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, I like to make things that are going to be fun. To, we create, try to create outreach events that are fun for kids, you know, and my yeah. big thing about the bees was, you know, because I was a public um, land person that um, I also, when I was a baby gardener, I call it, I was a greenskeeper on practice greens in the parks. Oh. And I learned, and so I learned about all the heavy pollution uh-huh. uh, and pesticides that golf courses use. Yeah. So I started an event we call Teas for Bees. Oh yeah. I saw that on and, your, your, right. your website. And that's, Right. We have kids hit seed balls into the outs, um, the open spaces at golf courses and they hit and they yell for the bees when they hit with the golf clubs. And it's more about getting, I mean, think about golf courses. I know the fact all that land, but how Nothing. much land that, and they're heavy polluters. So they're not really wanted in, in communities really as an asset, mm-hmm. but if we can convince them to go organic and start putting bird boxes and stuff in their open spaces mm-hmm. and their their roughs, they could become critical habitat for an endangered species. And then it gets a whole nother clientele yeah. for them. Yeah. And, now, and I and I talked to the land the landowners and the managers, and I said, look, people drove four and a half hours in bumper to bumper traffic to take a selfie with a poppy. <laughs> we could do that right here. We could do we could just start planting tons of wildflower seeds on your open spaces in near, and then people could come here and have super bloom Sunday brunches Mm -hmm. and save the deserts. You know, you guys could become critical habitat. And so that was what got me started with that project. And now it's like, so now we got, we helped um, touchstone foundation, a golf court, a golf company that maintains Golf courses, they also have a foundation. They got the um, Redwood Canyon Golf Course in Castor Valley is now Audubon certified. And oh, wow. they they put bird boxes and they, they the pesticide use is absolute, like only if there's an issue, mm-hmm. you know, because um, sometimes they get Phytophthora or yeah. not Phytophthora, but um, Fusarium and Pythium that can just wipe out a course in a night. But it's just that, Nobody was talking about it, you know, and even that there's proof that, you know, old care cake caretakers and golfers that like testicular cancer is really high. It's like, but no one was talking about it. It's like, this is an, a gentler way to talk about it mm-hmm. to me and get kids to want. And, and then there's this course actually rents golf. Um, they'll rent um, the golf carts to birders oh. in the twilight that's to go with the, the binoc- yeah. I'm like, it's another clientele for them yeah. and it's less work. So looking at, so that we don't waste all that land on just a sports view, yeah. you know, if we could change that, it's like that changing that perception mm-hmm. of what that space is used for. And that's really what I'm trying to do is come up with creative ways to work with people and landowners You know, it's kind of like the cattle thing, you know, don't plant milkweed because, no, we got to change that perception of if you're touching the dirt, you're a steward of your local ecosystem. Well, I I think keep it up. I mean, I think that's smart going at it because there's going to be golf courses. You're not going to argue and close down golf courses. That's just not going to happen. And so if you go in with that mindset, you know, you're going to get instant backlash because it's people live and die for golf. I mean, it seems exactly. Um, and so, it's, it, yeah. But if people knew that the more you play golf and everybody takes their gloves off when they get to the greens and yeah. it's the fungicides on the greens uh, that are causing cancer. So I'm like, no, don't take off your gloves because <laughs> then they, they pick up their ball and then they use their thumb to clean yeah. the mud off. And then 
lip cancer is very high in old golfers oh. too. It's like, it's like, but oh. if, so if the players are the ones pressuring uh-huh. the golf courses yeah. to go organic because uh-huh. they want a safer playing field, yeah. that's how we'll get it done. Not an environmental group mm-hmm. going and telling them you're bad. Exactly. I don't, I don't want to take away their field. I just want them to be a bigger and a happier asset in our communities yeah. because a lot of them are at the top of our watersheds too. So yeah. it's like looking at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And so, and making, you know, everybody would want a golf course in their neighborhood if they thought it was critical habitat and, and they could go, you know, rent a golf cart mm-hmm. and go birdie. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. then you're, it's not just at athletes. It's yeah. like everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think it's just changing a, a little bit, you know, like you're like, don't clean up all the debris in your yard, leave some, you know, a dead tree you know, that's safe to a certain, you know, start changing the mindset of it, allowing for pests, thinking that exactly. you know, you're going to tolerate and, and just changing that. We don't need this pristine, you know, I don't think you've ever gone to someone's garden and said, wow, your yard is so clean ever. Maybe <laughs> some people do, but it's usually a, like, wow, your garden is, 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 you know, I oh, hear the birds I, or it's so, there's so many flowers or it's so peaceful. Um, I have been, I've had people have me consult and I'll go to their yard and I'm like, this is the cleanest yard I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's like, and cause they want me to, they're like, how come I don't have bees and butterflies? Yeah. I'm like, there's no plants touching each other. Yeah. I mean, I can <laughs> picture it right now. I mean, I picture just yeah, a green it's like, lawn and these shrubs sheared to an inch of their life. And, and, you know, I think, or not even that they just don't let them touch each other. They're just like, <laughs> they plant them so far apart. Yeah. But it's like mm-hmm. it, the, the true, the true definition of a habitat is a, a place for food, shelter, and a place to raise their young. Mm-hmm. That's what they need. And a water source, a slow trickling water source is really important because then they can't drown, you know, like, yeah. um, or puddling trays for butterflies, male, males, male butterflies need electrolytes and some salts and nutrients that they get. Uh, um, and that's what you'll see them land um, uh, like in a dog park where the dogs have lifted their legs uh-huh. or even on feces because uh-huh. they're getting that, those spe- those important salts and electrolytes that they need from, or that the edges of a Creek or a river where the salts have washed ashore. Uh-huh. You'll see like males, um, like puddling together a bunch yeah. of male butterflies uh-huh. and a, f- a friend of mine tim wong just posted when he oh, was up tim. in the trinity alps yeah i know tim. oh yeah <laughs> yes don't, don't we all know yeah, tim? we all know tim he's, he's so we all know tim because he has he the best posted. job ever <laughs> oh my god i told him that i'm like tim how did you get this job and he's like i was working in an aquarium store before when i was going to college and i've been trying to get him I'm on like, the podcast yeah. forever but um yeah but I mean, I'll, I'll tease him. I'll tease him until yeah. I, I think podcast. he's, yeah, I think he's trying to make it, um, like, uh, for work. I think he's like, oh, I don't want to do something if work doesn't, I'm like, come on as yourself. And then you talk about, your no, job. He's, <laughs> he's a, he's a member of the posse. Yes, he's done yes. the butterfly summits with me and, yes. but he's, he's, he's way more than the posse, but he did for pipeline swallowtails. I remember, yes, you know, I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's why he, he's, he's kind of shy about taking all the credit. He's just, he that's, just likes to do what he does. And that's you know? why he's and, a great person. Cause you don't want people tooting their own horn. You know, he's just so humble. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but he's a fantastic gardener and a fantastic mm-hmm. human. Mm-hmm. But anyway, he posted, he just posted a video on Instagram this week when he was up hiking in the Trinity Alps of a bunch of male tiger swallowtails and pale swallowtails and Lorquin's admirals all puddling together. It's a great little video if you look at his Instagram account. Yeah. So that's um, what they're doing. It's the males and they're getting not so much the water, but more electrolytes. No, it's, it's minerals and salts and salts. stuff like that. And you'll see that a lot of times like in the open space on, on fecal matter of animals too. They land on um, the poop of, and they're getting these essential. So what can so it's, people do at home for that? In well, when- we, we, I did a couple of workshops where we taught people you can get sand mm-hmm. and then get a manure compost, mm-hmm. like um, steer manure or chicken manure. I think steer probably 
this better and mix it with the salt, mix it with the sand and put it in like the tray, you know, like the pot, a saucer from a pot. Okay. Mix it up in there and put it in your yard where the sprinklers will hit it. Okay. And so there's a little bit of, and then the, hopefully if you have butterflies in your, you know, they'll land in there and do some puddling. And that's the optimal you know? time is summer or yeah. Okay. Late, late, late spring, early summer. Okay. Late summer. Okay. Yeah. The, when they're breeding, okay. but that's an easy puddling tray. We did a workshop a couple of times doing that. It's okay. that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. So, and the um, bees make and, water too, but you don't want to drown them. Right. But that's honeybees. Native bees don't drink water. They don't drink water. They only get, no, they only do nectar. <sighs> Less so, maintenance. Um, I like it. <laughs> Explains yeah, why I only my, have honeybees drowning in my water for my cats outside. <laughs> I do see, I do see little tiny sweat bees. I wanted to ask an entomologist this uh-huh. because I do find them in my friend's pool. Cause like I borrow my friend's pool sometimes. And the first 20 minutes or 15 minutes, I'm just pulling all the little tiny <laughs> native bees out, yeah. of the, out of the pool and putting them on the ground. Yep, my yep. friend thinks I'm, no, nope, she, that's she's like, you, you really have, <laughs> <laughs> she goes, you are a nut, but it's like, I just get a leaf and it, they're tiny. These are tiny bees. They, and yeah. most people, that's the whole thing about native bees mm-hmm. is that they don't look like bees. So I, I, I put a bee house up in my friend's house and I, a friend of mine, they asked me to consult and we did wildflowers. Um, the one thing that if I could stress more than anything about pollinator habitat is that everybody talks about the pollen, the right shrubs to buy uh-huh. and to put in your yard. And we forget about the native wildflowers. The native wildflowers are the true powerhouses of the pollinator start of the, the season. Okay. You know, when you get the the lupin and the poppies and the um Leas, the, the tidy the, tips, the clarkias. But the facilias. Yes. Oh my god. Facilia, 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 oh facilias. Yep. Yep. You have to, mm-hmm. if you want native bees, you have to, buckwheats and facilias. Yeah, I and concur lupin. with the facilia. We had that mixed in at, at work um, with lupin. I mean, we have a whole bunch of wildflowers, but after a while, certain ones start taking over, which is fine. Um, certain point in the facilias, you just walk by and you're like, this is insane. It's almost like the basil. You're just like, I can't even count how many pollinators. Yes. Are when it comes flowers. to bumblebees, exactly. The bumblebees. Um, mm-hmm. we did a bumblebee training with California fish and wildlife. And I said, Oh, I know where we can find the bumblebees. <laughs> like, and we had planted, um, the Zerksky society worked with Hedro farms uh-huh. to create a central, their central Valley, um, a wildflower mix that they came up with is phenomenal. And we've done a bunch of trials with them. They also have a Bay area wildflower mix and the seed rate, the germination rate is phenomenal on the seed. I mean, it's just great. And it's got that mix. It's got the red maids. Mm-hmm. Oh no, that's the Bay area mix, but it's got the, the yellow lupin and the uh, facilia and the gum plant and the clarkias, the elegant clarkia and the woolly sunflowers. And it'll bloom from May, March until late September. And then you just snark it down with a scythe and then it comes back on its own the next year. And there's yarrow in that mix too. It takes a yarrow a couple of years to really take off. Yeah. But, oh my God, I would sit there and I'd put a chair near this hedgerow that we did as a, in Newcastle. And now I've been photographing because that's what most people don't do is sit and really appreciate yeah. their plants. Mm-hmm. Sit there in a, in a hot day because that's when they're out <laughs> And just watch. And I started photographing because I needed the, the, the data yeah. to say what I really am attracting so I can keep doing what I'm doing. Because I don't want to just be talking the talk, yeah. you know, if I'm going to spend this much time talking about it. <laughs> I want to show you. And this year I got to photograph the rare and endangered crotches bumblebee oh. in on a silver lupin um, in this where we planted that that. Um, that hedgerow in Newcastle and sent it to Xerxes and they're, they identified, they're like, crutchy eye, wow. <laughs> Bombus crutch. And wow. it was a big queen. It's just the biggest bee I've ever seen in Ooh, my life. I've never, fun. I mean, a, <laughs> like, yeah, she was like, my, the woman that um, she's a master gardener up here in Placer County. And she called me, she's like, Tora, Tora, you have to come see this bee. I, I don't, I don't recognize it. And it's huge. 
So I came the next day and I just parked my, you know, camera right in front of this lupin that she kept nectaring on the day before. And sure enough, she showed up. She showed up. Wow. And, and she was the biggest bee I'd ever seen. Aww. I'm like, that was why she was easy to photograph yeah. because she's so slow. I know. You know? I, I wanted to do that, like get better pictures of all the pollinators just so I could start IDing them. Because there well, are so I got many. the pictures. You got the pictures. I'm <laughs> like, but then I have to get my picture. So I, because, you know, they're so fast and a lot of them are so tiny. You know, I'm like. They're so tiny. I, the I Oz... can't see you. <laughs> so. <laughs> and the bumble, the, the poppy bees mm -hmm. are so tiny. And the orange of the poppy is so vibrant. They're really hard to photograph mm. because the camera. But yeah. I did learn the trick if people want to photograph you can't just have a fast camera. It's the SD card that you used has to upload the information fast also. Oh. So like when you got the SD card, it'll say like times 50 times 95 or whatever. You want like a time X 95 got because it. it has to transfer from the lens to the, to that SD card fast enough got for you to it. catch them. Okay. It's not just shutter speed. I was thinking it was all yeah. shutter speed and aperture, but no, it's not. And you just keep your finger on the trigger and just, you'll know, take thousand fake photos and maybe one will catch her. Yeah. I, I'm, so, so, I'm so used to taking slow pictures of all my beneficial insects at work where it's like, here's a mealybug that's going to move maybe a millimeter today. <laughs> <laughs> Know. Yeah, so then, you want to challenge yourself? Go to <laughs> well, go yeah, to the yeah, yeah. native bee garden. I will say though, the parasitic wasps that I have at work oh, yeah. are some of the tiniest, tiniest insects, and pretty darn fast. They're my favorites. Yeah, and, I love the parasitic wasps. Oh, so I love, tiny. Love, 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 but love. Luckily, though, they stay still, so I could get my hand lens in, and I'm able to at least ID them when they're sort of still. But taking a picture. That's, that's, well, that's difficult. <laughs> this, that movie I told you about my garden of a thousand bees, he discusses how he had to create um, special lenses and oh stay far away from the lens because the bees are so fast. Yeah. And I learned a lot from him. He had to film everything in slow motion to capture them. Oh, I'm sure. So yeah. now, now with my iPhone, I just bought a macro lens that you clip mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going out to the flowers and filming in slow motion. Oh, how fun. Okay. And that's, then you can catch those little tiny bees. You just have oh, to sit still. I might have to get one of those. You know, those. <laughs> but normally, normally what I do though, is I sit with an SLR. I have a Nikon and with the telephoto lens and I'm zooming in because oh. you can't, the macro lenses, they just fly away. They don't let you get that close. So um, most of my photos and I've taken quite a lot of different species of native bees now this last two years. Um, COVID was good for something for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sit outside with the telephone yeah. lens. But I do, I have ID'd. I still, the bumblebees are so hard because it just could be one segment off that little yellow stripe mm -hmm. and it's a different species. Yeah. You know, you have the, so um, there, I've been learning a lot, but the native bees, 1600, you know, but I, yeah. And they're tiny. Some of yeah. them, you know, like I said, I, I did a, a friend up here, her yard and showed her and introduced her to some of the native bees, a leaf cutter bee. And they, we put a bee house up, they used it right away. Um, and I showed her the pictures of what I was capturing in her yard. And she's like, Oh, Oh my God, how many native bees have I killed with my fly swatter thinking Yo. it was a wasp? Yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> I'm a lot like, of, yeah. Yeah, sadly, yeah. I think people, you know, like I said, there's so it's a good thing though because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm afraid of bees. Oh, I'm scared of bees. Well, they're speaking honeybees, so it's, it's almost good that sometimes people don't know they're bees because as soon as you say bees, and that's why I say wasps, right. like parasitic wasps, people are like, oh, I'm I don't want those in my garden. I'm like, no, 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 no wrong, no. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the wasps and paper wasps now are becoming a, a really bad predator for monarchs. Because they were introduced here, but they're European paper wasps. Oh. Well, and I got so, I got um, stung five times by the same nest this year for paper wasps. So they're on my shit list. <laughs> yeah, I remove the nests. I only yeah. leave a few. I, I, yeah. And I don't, but I did see, because 
they didn't need, they didn't have their own predators that I knew of until I saw a jay take a nest and eat the larva out of it. Ooh. I was like, yes. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I watched a jay. Yeah. So it's another kind of grub. Yeah. Think about it, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's like good. knock okay. them down and leave them for the jays. Yeah. <laughs> this one's tucked underneath. That's probably why it's still there. It's tucked underneath sort of a lip of a, a raised bed. So I don't, with plants over it. So I think that's my. Oh, baby. yeah. Where are, so I want to, um, where but let's talk about native bees don't sting. Most, yeah. almost all, not very few of the male bees okay. even have a stinger. And the females, they more likely to bite you with their mandible if you squeeze them. Well, yeah. And they don't I mean. sting. And you're not, and you're not, and people are not allergic to native bees. So that's why we want people to get away from the honeybees. Like, like this, all these companies that say save the bees, it's, because the, if you think about the bee movement actually started more in Europe, Europe, when they started the colony collapse, mm -hmm. and that's where they're from, they're European honeybees. So that's, and it, that message just carried over here where they're not the main pollinators. Like they're not the ones pollinating our open spaces. They're not the ones pollinating our forests and our, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's, that's not the most important. And so when, and people got confused even like they called me and said, oh, we want, we, we're wild bee collectors and we want to help you because you were, they, we heard that you help wild bees, but they were confusing the honeybees that got loose oh, and yeah. are like, you know, like the kind that are in swarms. the trees, yeah, yeah, the swarms that have yeah. found their own cavities and that they're bad because now what's happening is they're finding that the varroa mites are getting transferred to bumblebees because they, uh. the, the honeybees are leaving disease and mites on flowers. And now the native bees are starting to get them. So we don't want commercial beekeepers being allowed to, to leave their hives on public land. You know, I think, cause they're, they're actually, honeybees are actually managed livestock. They're not a wild creature. Mm -hmm. We manage them and we manage them poorly commercial. I'm sorry. They don't like to be traveling. They're territorial. They only live four weeks. They have four weeks to learn where the pollen and nectar is and to tell the rest of the hive and then they die. So if you, they learned where it all is and then you move them, you're stressing your bee out and yeah. you wonder why your colony collapse. I'm like, a failed uh, beekeeper. Um, <laughs> and I, I could, I pissed off our bees cause I try to move them and boy, they were not, they're not happy. No, no, their whole life yeah. is, well, you know, if like you just look at their life cycle, it's, they go out there, they learn, the workers are out there busting mm -hmm. their butt to bring, and they have to bring pollen and nectar to feed all the larvae. That's why they don't pollinate as well as the others. The others don't, the male native bees don't bring back pollen and nectar to anything. They're just out belly flopping from flower to flower. Interesting. So Okay, well, I would don't highly hate recommend. Me. Don't hate me, and I won't put the one back. But I just interviewed a beekeeper and my friend who's a beekeeper. So don't. No, 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 no. Like, I know. But don't don't get me wrong though. <laughs> they're just not the answer no. to yeah. Yeah. helping the planet. But they're from other countries. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just it's mm -hmm. the same. It's we they shouldn't be saving the bees is not you know it's not what we think. It's yes. saving the native bee. And um, people who have like one hive in their backyard, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't think is problematic. It's commercial beekeeping where they truck them from Texas yeah. to California yeah. and then back. And it's like, and then when their bees dies, they get subsidies. It's like, no, you're yeah. a bad livestock owner. That's because yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. You're not, yeah. You're not supposed to disturb them. Here they are lifting them with cranes and moving them and yeah. And trucking them. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's everything they're doing is stressful to that bee. Mm -hmm. And, but I, to me, I was accused, I was at a panel at the heirloom festival and I accused commercial beekeepers of being negligent livestock owners. I'm like, cause if, if you're, if you have sheep and say your, your field is, is been eaten down, you can't just take your sheep and put it in your neighbor's yard and expect their neighbor to feed them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what honeybee keepers do when their crop is done. They just want to put them on public land and let everybody else feed their bees. No, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you should have to plant hedgerows that keep your bees fed year round. Don't give them sugar water. That's like yeah. having Red Bull for breakfast. Yeah. It's like I said, if you work with farmers and that's your business, then yeah, farmers should be creating hedgerows because bees are not dormant the same time as your crops are. 
bees are year round needing nectar because it's, we have a very temperate climate here. Yeah, It's like, so it's, you know, I feel for the honeybee, it's like, this isn't how they want to live, mm-hmm. you know? So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to be a honeybee keeper, cause you like honey plant a garden that feeds them year round. So yeah. 365 days of nectar and it for them. And, um, and it's easy to do. That's, on my resources page, I have an, a plant list okay, and I did it on a chart, mm-hmm. a spreadsheet that is in the months that they bloom and the, the squares that they're blooming is the color that they bloom. So it's really designer friendly. And where, where do so you, you can where, come up with, where's this at your uh, website? Po- yeah. Pollinatorposse.org under resources. Okay. You'll see the plant list. You click on that and it's a spreadsheet. Okay. And that most of those plants were taken from the Bees and Blooms of California book by Gordon Frankie and Robin Thorpe. I started with that book because I really wanted to put things that are native bee friendly, you know, but there's also butterfly. I'm going to add a lot more butterfly plants too, but for people here, if you're, I don't know if your main people that listen to you are from California or they're primarily in in the the Sacramento Sacramento. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, we're lucky here in Sacramento area because we have Art Shapiro's website too. And he has the butterfly gardening for um, the foothills and butterfly gardening for Sacramento area. And it's so thorough. And what is his, so between, and for people who don't know, Art Shapiro is the uh, professor at UC Davis. And yeah, he's got the longest continuously long, long, the longest continuous study sites of any, entomologists in the world Mm -hmm. i mean he's they've been studying these sites for over 50 years now every for two every two weeks and nobody's nobody has that much data and he's and he says everything's moving north you know he's you know he's he's because he's an he is a professor of evolution and ecology so he is watching the evolutionary Mm -hmm. changes that are happening and that's what he's paying attention like the phenology missinks and stuff like that um, and he talks about anise swallowtails need help. The copper, um, the great copper, um, purple copper, because mm-hmm. it uses mistletoe as its host plant and people cut mistletoe out thinking it's bad. Oh. And so, yeah, that and his, his website, his butterfly for gardening, um, okay. gardening for butterflies is a great resource. Okay. Um, like I said, on my page. And Cowscape, go to Cowscape, put your zip code in. And if you bounce all three things off of each other, it yeah. should be no, it should not be hard okay. to figure it out. And but I'll, um, I'll put those in the show notes too. So Right. But buckwheats, oak trees, buckwheats, and facilias and wildflowers. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's in milkweed. <laughs> those, <laughs> those right there. If that's all you could do, then right there. They're, that's, they're there. And don't forget Tithonia, Tithonia. <laughs> in the verbenas. Yes. But it's like, it never ends. That's the problem is like, it depends on how small your space is. Mm-hmm. It really, so if you have a small space, like for me thinking big, like if I only have a little space in my backyard, then I want things that are going to be used by a lot of different insects instead of just one, you know, because I only have a limited space. Exactly. So buckwheats, buckwheats, there's like 26 different Lepidoptera that use buckwheats. Okay. And buckwheats could be huge um, and they could be quite small too. So um, yeah, the nudum, the little yellow sulfur one. I love that one. Oh, it's so cute. I love that one. Mm-hmm. And the hair streaks, the bees and the hair streaks go crazy. Yeah. If you put that one in facilia, because facilias are purple uh-huh. and again, get more than don't just get the annual facilia, get the perennial facilia mm-hmm. too. And it's like, you have a beautiful garden and yeah. then put some white yarrow and it's like, Bam. Look at you just designed <laughs> someone's yard for them. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, that's people, my thing. People, you know, I think the lists are important because people like to know what should I plant? You know, they're very like, giving me a list, uh, you know, and, and you know, cause they might, maybe they have more space for some, but I think those, those sites and, uh, pollinator posse that org has a lot of, like you have upcoming events on there. You have a lot of resources. Um, Lot yeah, of and all of our talks, on. all a lot of our t- uh, talks are all recorded and are on there. Okay. Um, we do a lot of talks for garden clubs and other organizations. Um, like I said, we just worked with the Berkeley Libraries because um, there was a grant 
that American Meadows was giving out wildflower seeds um, around that movie I was talking about, My Garden of a Thousand mm-hmm. Bees. So we were, we've been doing a lot of things with the Berkeley Library, um, but also up here, Placer County, I just did the Master Gardeners up here, have a really strong pollinator committee and I just did a talk for them. Um, and it was all around the native bees I found in that one Master Gardener's yard. Um, wow. So like showing them, like she, these are the native plants that she planted, and you know it's it's really good if you can show them you know if you can show people in their region what works yeah. is always helpful and that um you know so i we have different talks now sometimes just on monarch sometimes native bees um but like i said really the the end all to me is really that you just think of yourself as a, a steward of the local ecosystem um and we start with the pollinators cuz the rest will follow yeah. And we didn't you know. even talk about hummingbirds and bats and, you know. And oh, hummingbirds. Well, because we'll, we'll all they get you on. They later. don't need a spokes. <laughs> yeah. They don't need a spokesperson. They're, they're, they're their own best commercial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, just like know, today, it, I was, you know, having students smell fly pollinated flowers. And, uh, you know, they could guess oh, how cool. The, they could guess what the number one pollinator, guess what the number two is. But when I tell them, like, flies are up there is like number three, you know, I'm like, we don't really plant fly gardens. <laughs> You know, yeah, we we did actually a talk. We had a talk um, because of one of our our funders. Um, he has a conservatory in his yard um, in Oakland, and he had um, the uh, dang it, I just went blank. The corpse flower. The corpse flower. Uh-huh. Yeah, he had yeah. a corpse flower finally bloom yeah. for the first time, and for and he turned it into a, a fundraiser for the posse. Oh, how nice. so we did a whole talk. Okay. We had Damon teach. He, Damon did a whole talk on pollinating flies. Oh, yeah. And so it's, that's on there too, I believe, on their resource yeah, list. Yeah, and sure enough, you know, we picked the stapelia flower, put it out, and you know, few, within a few hours, there's just maggots all over it. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean that's a fun it's, one, but <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. It's like the stinkhorn mushroom. Yeah. Like, oh, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm. We have. We have a lot of those in our garden in Oakland, believe it or not. Oh, how fun. Um, I don't know where they came where they came from. I had no idea what it was at first pop. I was like, oh, it's quite what is that weird? Yeah. I'm like, what is that weird Rubik's Cube thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A- alien poop or uh-huh. something. It's like it definitely man, stopped you flies. in the tracks. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And then when you see what's pollinating, you're like, oh, that's what that uh-huh. smell is. So yeah. 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 Well, this is great. I'm going to put the resources up so people could check out the website, check out your organization because you guys are doing really important stuff. Um, and, and we can always use donations. We're yeah. totally, we're all volunteer based. Okay. Um, nobody gets paid. And then as much money as we can get, I want to put it into seed and plants in the ground. Okay. And there's links you know? on there to donate or do you want to? Th- mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, there's a donate button. Okay. Yeah. And then, or if you want to just join the posse, we're always looking for more volunteers to do some of these events with us. And um, I also like to link people up if they're landowners Mm -hmm. to um, there's lots of grants and money out there for, especially for milkweed um, for landowners um, through different organizations. And I like to connect them, you know, to help people out so um, they can contact us. Okay. You know, um, yeah. Because it's really all about getting the plants in the ground. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. you know, so anywhere, everywhere, <laughs> it's just, but, but remember to not get bad plants in the ground. <laughs> the okay. neonics, the pesticides. Yes. Yeah. Just don't. Yeah. Just stop with the pesticides. Stop with the, sp- you know. Right. It- well, we have here in Sacramento that you guys have that great master gardener. Um, the Sacramento master gardeners have their own native plant nursery. I think it used to be called elderberry, but now it's called something else. But that's that's a yeah. really great resource mm-hmm. to get plants. Yeah, that's down, I think, in Elk Grove. I think. I think elderberry farms, I think. That's I know that's a plant a native plant one. I'm not sure no, if it's I think California it's a, native. Yeah. I don't know. Well, the one in Oak Grove, there is a cornflower farm. Cornflower, that that's is, the one. Okay. Cornflower. But that's farm. a whole that, yes. that's a wholesale nursery, but okay. that's that's not for the public. Okay. You so, know, that's a wholesale nursery. And I have had a talk with him about neonics and he doesn't use them unless he has an infestation. Okay. So okay. I've asked him, can you at least let people know if you have sprayed it? Yeah. Because they only plant, they only grow California natives. To me, that's 
bad. Yeah. Like no na- no California native plant should be sprayed with neonic, but yeah. they promise they did promise us that they won't spray it okay. unless they have an infestation. But um, but elder the master gardener elderberry nursery is in Sacramento Got somewhere. It. Okay. Um, okay, and that's run by the master guard Sacramento master gardeners, and that is I know they don't use pesticides uh, there, and right. they're yeah. And there's a lot well, of thank small... you. This is fun. Yeah, this is fun. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to um, one, I'm gonna have to get have Tim on now that we could you could pressure him, but um, yeah, I hope to come out to one of your events. Um, and stuff. Uh, yeah, That'd we be, should. That would be fun. We should do something fun. So, all right, we everyone. should do something yeah. near UC Davis. You know, definitely. <laughs> I'm I'm almost to zero spray at the conservatory, so that's my goal. Is you know, because we do in greenhouses, it's really tricky not spraying. And it's hair. so, yeah. yeah, you have, you have a really tricky, mm-hmm. it's much easier for me out in the open. <laughs> it's outside of my garden, outside, super easy. Our outside gardens, we don't do anything inside. You've got rare plants, get pressure. You don't, you know, have, you know, have a lot of established the, beneficials, but pressures build. And, and But so far. Yeah, the, the fungal properties are hard too. Yeah. 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 All right, everyone. Well, Until thank next you. time, happy gardening.